10 biggest Yu-Gi-Oh fails. Yeah, I know we're supposed to be celebrating the Yu-Gi-Oh 25th anniversary, but I think we should highlight its missteps too. Let's kick it off with the first one. The Lost Art Program. Oh, okay, so this is an interesting one. Yeah, it's not immediately, a f it doesn't seem immediately like a fail, right? You get uncensored versions of censored cards. This game has always had censored cards. And Yu-Gi-Oh players have always been like, why won't Konami just stop? I wish I could get uncensored Dark Magician Girl. And yeah. we finally got a program that would let us get them. Right. I think that's, uh, I mean, I like the Lost Ark program. I thought mm -hmm. it was really cool. I remember they started with like Exodia and Monster Reborn and that was fun. I think that the only place that it really goes wrong or that you could kind of call it a fail is that they still censor the cards. Yeah, that's my issue with it too. I remember when they announced the Lost Art program, and this is kind of, might, might be a little bit on us, there was a lot of speculation that, oh, maybe we won't get as many censored cards in Yu-Gi-Oh anymore. Maybe we're moving towards an uncensored card game. And yeah. they're just gonna uncensor all the old ones slowly. Wrong. But as it turns out, <laughs> yeah, they still do censor cards. And I think it gets at its squirreliest when there is a card that will release and it's censored, and then like three months later, the uncensored one releases. Yeah, I was I and was really scratching my head with some like good examples. It was Mitsu the Insect Ninja, Harpy what, Conductor was Harpy one that Conductor. I was, like, kind of think of, and uh, what's her name, Nurse Dragon Maid, the pink one. Like they're already in the Lost Art program as un, un in their uncensored versions, and that just shows that we're gonna continue to censor cards and then just kind of uncensor them once for a promo and then like maybe in another reprint later on they'll be censored again so i'm saying this feels like the lost art program is going to outlast Yu-Gi-Oh, because this game can literally stop and the lost art program could just continue for years uncensoring our cards yeah now for what it's worth i mean i think that it does make lost art cards kind of a cool one-off thing mm -hmm. like if you miss the promotional period then like it kind of feels like there's something special there that you might have missed out on. And that's cool. I just think that it's weird when like a card, like when new cards come out censored and then get a lost art. Like I, I think that it should have been relegated to um, like maybe just the older cards like Skill Drain or, you know, Donzalug and stuff. This is one of those things where we're giving us, we're, we're being given a solution to a problem that Konami created. Like, a little how bit, about we just yeah. fix the problem completely? Second fail is... Hey guys, so real quick, this video is sponsored by Whatnot, the service for buying and selling all sorts of cool hobby collectibles and things like that. And we're going to be doing our very first of several live streams on Whatnot this weekend, Sunday at 3 o'clock p.m. in Central Time. You can tune in and get the chance to win some really cool stuff, such as... For one thing, I've got this huge stack of Yu-Gi-Oh! playmats that I'm going to be selling, like this World Championship one with Blackwing Full Armor Master, several Comic-Con exclusive mats like Yu-Gi! and Exodia. That could be pretty cool for the new Exodia support coming out. Got the Duel Links 2023 one. Got this Yusei Fudo 2010 regional playmat. Could be pretty fun for you Edison lovers. Plus, I'm even going to be giving away some things like rescue rabbits i know these are really really popular promos at Yu-Gi-Oh events or even if you didn't get a chance to get the pot collection maybe you can see it through there that's one of the things i'll be selling as well some retro packs like dark revelations 3. you can sign up to whatnot using our link down in the description below if you do you'll actually get a ten dollar credit that you can use on anything maybe the stream that's coming up and just a reminder, that stream is going to be this Sunday at 3 p.m. Central Time. Tune in and maybe get a chance to win some of this cool Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. Playable prize cards. So this one I had to put on the list because of Minerva the Exalted Lightsworn. At first they were usually cards that kind of like would have the you cannot use this in a duel thing. Right, unplayable Like promos. these match winner sort of cards. But I do think that the idea of a prize card that you can't actually use like is fine whereas a prize card that you can use and is good that was see that was my thing yeah it's, it's one thing to have a prize card that's playable mm -hmm. it's a whole other thing to be good and for Maybe, an archetype yeah for an archetype being needed for an archetype definitely changes it because like if you were a light sworn fan minerva is a really exciting thing they finally have an mm -hmm. exes monster and like works well with the strategy the only way modern way to play light sworn at the time then it's like you know 2,000 bucks or however yeah, much. Yeah, like 2K. Also, mm -hmm. uh, what is it? Chaos Emperor Dragon, the Dragon of Armageddon, which is sort of the retrain of like Chaos Emperor. I remember that card well because there was specifically a dragon deck you could run in that meta game, but yeah. you could only run it. You were playing like him. Dragon Thunder, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, that was another card that had a really good effect that was like, actually usable in a deck. And so it kind of made it where if you were like a tippy top player who'd won the card, then you had a distinct advantage over the rest of the field because there's really only so many copies yeah. of this card. You have and one not whole can get extra it. deck to run. Because part of me is like, well, it's cool that, you know, if you win a Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, you get a rare prize card that only you have and it powers mm -hmm. up your deck. But it also might kind of come across as like a rich get richer thing. And I like think the rest about of like it. Dragon fans and Light Swarm fans at the time. It's like it comes as a prize card, and you really want it for your deck. You don't have a thousand just to burn on the card. Say, like, okay, I guess I'll have to wait on it. And at least in the case of Minerva, we had literally no clue. Yeah, there's no indication that this might ever get really get reprinted. Now, in hindsight, they both got printed almost exactly two years after they came out. But that's still a long time, right? It is a wait, yeah. The next one on our list is the quarter century rare. And now, Paul and I did disagree on this one. Yeah, I didn't think that this was a bad fail, really. But I can't stand them, so it's a huge fail to me. Okay. So the quarter century rare, they followed the starlight rare as our like chase rarity in our products. You can have all your opinions on whether or not it looks better. I'm not arguing about their looks. That's an opinion thing. I'm talking about the fact that we went from having just like, what, four starlights in a set? And then we have 25 in our sets for quarter centuries. I think that there are a lot of quarter century rares that came out in these sets and it can kind of devalue them. Like I they mean, can feel a little cheapened by the fact that there are so many. You can pick up quarter century rares on TCG player for a couple cents. Yeah, there are some that are really, really cheap. Um, and also, I do think that they didn't differentiate themselves that much visually from Starlights. Whereas things like Collector's Rare, Ghost Rare, um, even like Ultimate Rare, they have better differentiated themselves visually as a rarity. I think when you pull the Starlight Rare, it felt very special and meaningful because there were so few in a set. Starlight Rares almost always felt like they were meaningful, but Quarter Century Rares? You can just pull some nonsense as a quarter century. Yeah, there are some cards that are quarter century where it's like, oh, this is not the one I wanted to pull. But in its defense, I will say that I do think that being able to pull a quarter century more easily means that more people get to have like a memorable moment with opening a pack. So but when that. it's the Tastina boss monster, how memorable is that really? The next one though is one that's pretty funny and you might not know about it if you don't have a bit of a history with it. I video. forgot about this. It's Sea Monster of Theseus. So this one, I just knew I had to include it because this is a card that you might have already seen in your bulk or something like that. It's a level five zombie fusion monster without any effect actually, or anything super significant about it. It does take two tuners to make. And the reason why this is a fail is because Konami actually said early in the year in 2017, when this came out, they released this sort of teaser article on their blog where they were like, okay guys, we're about to reveal the effect of the most, or one of the most influential cards of this upcoming year. Now, influential and Sea Monster of Theseus should not go together. Yeah, and so then they released Sea Monster of Theseus, and it's this vanilla fusion that, to its credit, has a few quirks. I mean, I mean it's an instant fusion target. It's, it's an a zombie. Fusion target. Zombie kind of can help. It's level a five. It's a tuner, yeah, level five tuner. I remember when Sea Monster of Theseus came out, and I was really excited for it. So like, oh, so. There's gotta be some like crazy thing I can use this card for to make zombies relevant again. And as Paul reminded me, uh, that was zoo format. Yeah. Zombies that was the didn't year do we had anything. Zodiacs and two Draco and you know, it just yeah, that wasn't really wasn't really doing it. Um mm -hmm. I think that this is only really a fail because Konami hyped the thing up. Yeah. And then it ended up It became <laughs> it was less than impressive. Yeah, this card just released as a card then there would be no fail, it just would probably be forgotten. Do you remember when we did draft in Top Cut? Imagine this, right? You're at a YCS and you're playing through Swiss with your, your carefully constructed deck and then you painstakingly make day two and then they tell you to put your deck in your bag and leave it there. Yeah, because in the Top Cut of YCS events, you had to play with battle packs sealed draftable product mm -hmm. that they made. They made Battle Pack 1, there's a Battle Pack 2, a Battle Pack 2 Part 2, a Battle Pack 3. These are super fun, to their credit. Uh, as fun as kind of drafting can be, I think that for a lot of the top players of the game, if you, like you said, you know, you go through these really grueling rounds with a carefully constructed and tested deck, and then you're asked to draft, 
it feels like it's putting a lot more in the hands of Chance now. A lot more of Chance, but also it's a, it's a lot more stress for the player. Because right now, if you go to a YCS, you're preparing for the one format. But at that point, you had to prepare for two formats. I think this started in 2013. And it lasted, I think, for a, a good year one or so. full year. I think yeah, in 2014, they axed this program. I think that there's some upsides to this. There is the fact that, you know, the drafting format is meant to put everybody on an equal playing ground. Right. If so, you don't have access to certain cards, it's exactly, fine. Exactly, yeah. Like, everybody has access to kind of the same general pool of cards. Um, the most expensive deck can't, like, win, so to speak. Right. However, drafting is a bit of a stressful process when, you know, your YCS life is on the line here. Somebody might draft really powerful band cards because those were in those like early in the, battle packs. Yeah, in the first battle pack, I mean, there was Graceful Charity, Demock, Pot of Greed. Yeah, and Feather Duster, <laughs> Raigeki, cards that were at the time banned. There's an insane, and there was an insane chance that when you drafted in Top Cut at those events, you wouldn't see any of those cards and your opponents will see all of them. Yeah, and if that happens, that can certainly feel like uh, a very unfulfilling sort of get YCS railroaded. experience. I think I see what they were going for. I think that there was kind of this, you get through the tournament, for the majority of the tournament, you get through it on like mm -hmm. your deck. And then at the end, there's kind of this twist that tests your skill as a duelist. But I buy it. I have a but, theory. Okay. See, I want to believe this was to even the playing field, right? Mm -hmm. But I think the goal was to, I, to in move, my opinion, move battle pack product. Yeah, I think they were just pushing product that way. The next Yu-Gi-Oh fail is the Platinum Dark Magician. They released these sort of silver, you know, super fancy special Dark Magician and Blue Eyes cards. It started with Blue Eyes. Mm -hmm. I think this was in 2020. Yep. And um, it cost one thousand dollars. Now, obviously you're probably thinking, okay, what the heck, why am I gonna pay that much? It wasn't meant for everybody. It was for kind of the high-end Yu-Gi-Oh collector. You get this Blue Eyes White Dragon card. It's special, it kind of comes in this plaque. It's a whole thing. And it did sell out. Those things disappeared. Yeah, so, when they released it, it was like a, you had to be on the website mm -hmm. when it dropped and they sold out fast. And some people were trying to buy like threes, they're gonna have like three Blue Eyes and all that stuff. Which is insane. Konami saw that success and then they released a Dark Magician. 300 more. Yeah. Than the blue eyes. Yeah, Dark Magician released at thirteen hundred dollars. Now I guess you could argue that maybe inflation was the reason for this, but do you think Dark Magician is three hundred is worth three hundred dollars more than Blue Eyes? I'd say it's worth probably three hundred dollars less. Yeah. And it's mostly because like Blue Eyes has more of the star power in Yu Gi Oh than Dark Magician does. Blue Eyes is our Charizard, effectively. When people see Blue Eyes, they know Blue Eyes. People see Dark Magician, and they have to think about it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, Dark Magician, suffice it to say, did not sell out. And in fact, that's kind of become their like social media giveaway product. Yeah, they will, they've been giving them away. You can still buy them on the website. Yeah, too. they will constantly, you know, on a lot of different Yu-Gi-Oh accounts, they'll give them away as like a prize or they'll just remind you that you can still buy one before they sell out. <laughs> so this next fail was, maybe it was the right move at the wrong time. Okay. This was Yu-Gi-Oh Cross Duel. Oh man, this one hurts. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming a lot of people know about Cross Duel. It was a game, it came out in 2022, and it wasn't Yu-Gi-Oh! as we know it, or in any fashion we've ever seen. Yeah, so Yu-Gi-Oh! Cross Duel actually got announced around the same time that Master Duel and everything else did. It came out a bit later mm -hmm. than it did, but it was a mobile game. It had a more unique rule set. It, it was marketed as a four-player battle royale. Yeah, sort of way to duel as a battle royale and you summon monsters on lanes, they move around the board. Um, conceptually kind of cool. It had like this vibe of maybe um, Duelist of the Roses or Dungeon Dice monsters a little bit when before we like, knew anything. Maybe like a mobile version of that idea. The game came out though to very, very lukewarm response. I mean, there was almost, there was virtually no audience at all. Yeah, a lot of people didn't even completely understand what it was, the marketing for it was a little bit botched, but I think what it ultimately came down to was that it was not the Yu-Gi-Oh that people were familiar with, and I think that it just wasn't what Yu-Gi-Oh players were wanting at the time. No, Master Duel was on the horizon, and that's what Yu-Gi-Oh players were locked in on. We already had Duel Links, Master Duel was coming. It just felt like there were probably too many digital Yu-Gi-Oh like live service games happening at the same time, and this was just the weakest link among them. And so eventually, exactly one year later actually, it got sunset, discontinued, yeah, it, it turned the, off the servers. It, it, it did not last, and that, it's a shame because the game had, they 
it was made with quality. It wasn't like you turn the game on, it's a buggy mess and it looks horrible. Yeah, it actually was of the Yu-Gi-Oh games, one of the few new games that had like models for like new models for new a lot models, of the monsters. Voice acting. Yeah, full voice acting for all the named characters. Clean UI. Yeah, looked and ran fine, just wasn't popular. I think Cross Duel f had a failure of, I think, market research. Yeah, They're I just, think they just didn't know who it was for. Or maybe they didn't quite market it to that person. Yeah, a lot of effort to like no to no audience. That brings us to our last three fails in this list. The first yeah. one being Pendulum Monsters. Uh, so this is near and dear to my heart because I really wanted to love Pendulums and I did embrace them when they came out. A lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players disagree. Yeah. So I want to be clear about why we're considering Pendulums a fail. I don't think that Pendulums mechanically are a fail. I don't love the mechanic all that much myself, but I don't think that it has anything to do with why it maybe was or wasn't popular. I think, I think it's more about what they represented to a lot of people and the at effect the time. it had at, on the community. Yeah. So Pendulum Monsters, you know, they're half monster, half spell. So, already we're in uncharted territory. Yeah, so it's already visually a bit of a shakeup. And it looks confusing because not only are they half monster, half spell in color, but they have two effect text boxes. And we already don't like reading our cards. Yeah, so like, you know, you have to read double effects. Pendulum monsters have some of the rec have broken record for like some of the longest card mm -hmm. effects in the game. Then they have a mechanic with scales on the sides. Yeah, these little diamonds, they have the numbers on yeah, them. Yeah, there's a red scale and a blue scale, and they've got numbers and a specific set of rules that work with them. And while it's not the case today, when they release, they even changed the playmat itself. They mm -hmm. added two specific pendulum, like, zone areas where you could only place pendulum cards. It meant that your old playmat that had zones in it was now obsolete. technically obsolete and outdated. It also meant that they could basically play extra spells and traps if you consider, you know, the pendulums mm -hmm. to sort of be that, then it's just, there were new rules, there were new monsters. And then the final nail in the coffin to me is that pendulums didn't play nice with other decks. No, and they, di they didn't p play well with a player who didn't know what they did, because mm -hmm. they had their own rulings. Yeah, they had their own rulings. It's like, oh, if the monsters go to your graveyard while they're in the field and they go to your extra deck face up instead which is really bizarre and new but if they leave the field in any other way yeah if they leave underneath like an Xyz monster they'll go to the grave or if they get discarded from your hand they go to the grave if you're a Yu-Gi-Oh veteran at this point you kind of know how pendulums go mm. but I cannot overstate how at the time this caused a lot of people to just be done a lot. Yeah, I kind of I stopped around the time uh, Pendulum came out. Cool. That's when they lost me. It, it was the first mass exodus of Yu-Gi-Oh that I'd ever seen. A lot of people were just like, yeah, this, is, this isn't the game I know. You know, I don't understand this mechanic. They're changing too much. It's getting too complicated. And all of that for what Pendulums eventually just became. A combo deck that runs pretty much the same Pendulum suit pieces. It just feels like now they're the redheaded stepchild where Konami doesn't really seem to want to give them good support cards. They're sort of struggling to keep up. They have to operate with the whole extra monster zone mechanics. It's very awkward. And I almost get the impression that maybe Konami just wishes they hadn't made them at all in the first place. I, with the way they keep making cards that completely shut down the mechanic, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's it's um, kind of like a two-pronged fail, because yeah, they one with the other. Yeah, the next fail is Link Monsters. Now, I need to say that I actually don't mind Link Monsters mechanically either. I think that I've more than, you know, they're kind of grown on me, they're fun. But a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players disagree. Yeah, a lot of people at the time did not like Link Monsters because the way that Link Monsters were released was a lot like how Pendulums were released. Two new zones in the playmat. Yep. Monsters that have a unique gimmick on the card with arrows. Mm -hmm. They don't have levels, they can't go face down, they have these Link ratings. Oh, they can't be in defense mode. Yeah, it can't be in defense mode. It's very just kind of a bunch of stuff, right? A huge new learning curve at a time when people already had left from Pendulum Monsters. Mm -hmm. You introduce another thing with a lot more rules, and this also caused a lot of people to just sort of fall out of love with the game. Yeah, the it broke people's decks. Link Monsters, at, when they first came out, you had to summon from your extra deck to the extra monster zone. You could not use the other zones for extra deck summons unless you had a link monster pointing to that zone. When it, when links came out, 
There were whole decks that just could not operate under that system. Yeah, because they when couldn't Link turn out, out links. They, yeah, they couldn't make the link monsters needed, and it really just made a lot of decks feel nerfed. Then you fast forward a couple of years in, and Link Monsters got some of the game's most broken cards that needed to all end up getting banned. It's insane how I'm, I'm talking about the OCG sets, Link Vrain series release crazy monsters. We're yeah. talking about Izold, Electromite, Vert Anaconda. So many things. Plus, you have cards like Firewall Dragon that ended up causing numerous FTKs, mm -hmm. Summon Sorceress. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and the bevy of Link 1 monsters that have also kind of become huge one card combo starters. The only extra deck monsters you can really make with one card. Like, yeah. So, all in all, I mean, I just definitely think Link monsters did maybe more harm to the outer shell of Yu-Gi-Oh's accessibility than good. It's all that's all fun in games when you're showing someone Yu-Gi-Oh and then you show them a pendulum and I'm like monster. That's usually where they jump off the boat. Yeah, these get these get a fail from me. Yeah. I went against somebody like that. I'm like, yeah, I'm not gonna be able to play this. No way. <laughs> Our final Yu-Gi-Oh fail is one that might surprise you and you probably don't even know about it. It is the Tokyo Dome Riot. So way back in 99, they tried to hold the greatest Yu-Gi-Oh tournament ever in Japan. It was modeled after Duelist Kingdom. Players were, were, they got invitations, they got star chips, and they were gonna wager them in epic duels. They opened it up to anybody who bought the Weekly Shonen Jump magazine, which at the time might have been their hottest selling magazine in Japan. And it blew up. Yeah, they ended up going over capacity and the actual event itself could not hold all the people who were excited to get this Yu-Gi-Oh promo card. And so a lot of people did not get promo cards. There were riots outside of the building and, and inside. inside. And this is actually a documented story. The very first, I would say, Yu-Gi-Oh catastrophe. The first yeah. Yu-Gi-Oh fail. If you ever thought, like, if you ever said, oh, they ran this tournament so badly, this tournament was awful. Ah, uh, <laughs> it can be a lot worse. Yeah. That concludes our list of the top 10 biggest mm -hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh fails. In order, you guys can let us know though down in the comments right. what you think were the biggest Yu-Gi-Oh fails. Do we need to reorder them or what did we miss? Yes, we'd love to know. Otherwise, make sure you drop a like on the video, subscribe so you don't miss the next one, and we'll see you guys in the next video. Past, Past turn. turn.